This is a picture test in practical anatomy of the upper limb. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the shoulder region and axilla. Identify the muscle A and the fascia at B to which bone is the muscle attached distally. This is latissimus dorsi muscle, the wide flat muscle of the back as its name indicates. Latissimus means wide. It arises from the lower six thoracic spines and from the lumbar spines as well. The origin from the lumbar spines is by means of fascia. This is the thoracolumbar fascia. The origin then continues on the iliac crest of the hip bone. The white fibers of the muscle then they converge to form a tendon that wraps around the lower border of teres major muscle to be inserted into the floor of the intertubercular groove of the humerus. And this is the distal attachment of the muscle. A 22 year old man is examined after sustaining a superficial stab wound to the anterolateral aspect of the chest, just above the level of the nipple. On examination, the medial border of the scapula on the injured side pulls away from the body wall when the arm pushes against the wall. In addition, there was difficulty in abducting the arm on the affected side above the level of the head. Which of the muscles shown in the picture is paralyzed? Now first let's identify the muscles. A is pectoralis minor lying underneath B which is pectoralis major and C which is located on the lateral side of the chest and has digitations is serratus anterior. Its digitations interdigitate with the digitations of D which is the external oblique muscle of the abdomen. At the location of the injury on the anterolateral aspect of the chest the nerve most likely injured is the long thoracic nerve. This nerve supplies serratus anterior muscle. We will see the nerve in other specimens in the pectoral region on the surface of serratus anterior just behind the mid-axillary line. Serratus anterior muscle protracts the scapula, that is to say moves the scapula forwards since the muscle is attached to the anterior surface of the medial border of the scapula. And when the muscle is paralyzed due to injury of its nerve supply, the medial border of the scapula appears to be projecting backwards, giving the appearance of a wing when the patient presses against the wall. This condition is called winged scapula. In addition, the patient is unable to raise the arm above the head owing to inability to rotate the scapula during abduction of the arms above a right angle. This lateral rotation of the scapula is established by the action of both serratus anterior and trapezius muscles, the upper and lower fibers of trapezius muscle acting like a couple. Identify the muscles attached to the bone at A and B and what is the nerve supply of each. The muscle A is teres minor supplied by the axillary nerve together with deltoid. Muscle B is bulkier teres major which is supplied by the lower subscapular nerve which also supplies subscapularis muscle. Identify the nerve A from which cord of the brachial plexus it originates and identify the muscle B and list two of its actions on the shoulder joint. This view shows mainly the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. The cords are named according to their relation to the second part of the axillary artery. Here the branches of the medial and lateral cord are retracted to show the posterior cord. The posterior cord has five branches. Two of them are large terminal branches, the radial nerve and the axillary nerve. So A is the radial nerve passing downwards to the arm 
along the posterior wall of the axilla. It is shown here lying on the glistening tendon of latissimus dorsi muscle B. This ribbon-like tendon of latissimus dorsi wraps around teres major to be inserted into the floor of the intertubercular groove of the humerus. The muscle is an adductor, extensor, and medial rotator of the arm at the shoulder joint. Identify the structures A to J. A is the lateral end of the clavicle, and B is the acromioclavicular joint. C is the acromion, forming the tip of the shoulder. D is the upper border, superior border of the scapula. E is the coracoid process of the scapula, the crow's beak. F is the spine of the scapula that extends laterally to form C, the acromion process. G is the glenoid fossa. H is the head of the humerus that is separated by the anatomical neck from the greater tubercle of the humerus, I, which is located laterally. J is the lateral border of the scapula. Identify the process A, name three ligaments attached to it. A is the coracoid process and it gives attachment to coracoacromial ligament between the coracoid and the acromion, forming the coracoacromial arch. And it also gives attachment to coracoclavicular ligament in its two parts, the conoid ligament and the trapezoid ligament. Together they constitute one ligament which is called the coracoclavicular ligament. The third ligament is called the coracohumeral ligament and this merges with the capsule of the shoulder joint, considered as an extrinsic ligament of the shoulder joint. So three ligaments are attached to the coracoid process and three muscles are attached to it and these are the biceps, coracobrachialis and pectoralis minor muscles. A 16-year-old male presented with this asymmetrical chest configuration and was diagnosed to have a congenital absence of muscle. Which muscle is absent in this patient? The muscle absent in this patient is pectoralis major and this results in the absence of the anterior axillary fold. The muscle is responsible for the formation of this fold and you can see here that this fold is absent here. However, some few fibers of the clavicular head are still there. So the absence here is mainly an absence of the sternocostal head of the muscle. Match the numbered phrases with the lettered structures. This is a horizontal section of the shoulder region showing the clavicle anteriorly and here is a vertebra posteriorly. You can see the lung within the thoracic wall and ribs are also seen here. Laterally is the humerus and the scapula. This is the head of the humerus in fact articulating with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. You can see the whitish cartilage here and this is the intertubercular groove on the anterior aspect of the humerus. Member of the rotator cuff group of the muscles shown here, this is F in the front of the scapula is subscapularis muscle. And this is a member of the rotator cuff group. Posteriorly located here is the infraspinatus muscle. And you can see that it is attached to the back of the greater tubercle of the humerus. It is another member of the rotator cuff group. So both subscapularis and infraspinatus are members of the rotator cuff group. Supplied by a cranial nerve, and this is the trapezius muscle, which is supplied by the accessory nerve. Here in this section, it is the outermost muscle, most superficial muscle, H. These are the lower fibers of trapezius heading for the spine of the scapula. Three, paralysis results in winging of the scapula. Winging of the scapula is produced by serratus anterior muscle that arises from the upper atribs and winds around the thoracic wall. 
it is E here. You can see it's a flat muscle in the front of subscapularis. And if you follow the muscle, you will find that it is attached to the anterior surface of the medial border of the scapula. That's why when this muscle contracts, it protracts the scapula. It moves the scapula forwards around the thoracic wall. Attached to the coracoid process, the coracoid process is not shown here, but the muscles attached to it, are two of them are shown here, and one of them here is pectoralis minor. This is pectoralis minor because it is narrow, small, and located deep to pectoralis major here. This is pectoralis major attached to the clavicle. This is the clavicular head, and pectoralis minor lies deep to it in its way to be attached to the coracoid process. And here is the bulk of short head of biceps and coracobrachialis. The long head of biceps is located here, the tendon that is located in the intertubercular groove of the humerus. But D is the short head of biceps and coracobrachialis. The three muscles represented in C and D are attached to the coracoid process of the scapula. Identify the nerves A and B. Which muscles do they supply? This is a dissection of the pectoral region showing a reflected pectoralis major muscle and an underlying pectoralis minor. The nerve B that pierces the pectoralis minor is the medial pectoral nerve. The nerve is on its way to pectoralis major muscle because it supplies both major and minor. Nerve A is the lateral pectoral nerve. It also supplies both pectoral muscles. The lateral pectoral nerve at this location, it pierces the clavipectoral fascia. Note here that the lateral pectoral nerve is medial to the medial pectoral nerve when they are seen in the pectoral region. In other words, the relation of the pectoral nerves in the pectoral region is the reverse of their names. So here it should be mentioned that the names of these nerves, medial and lateral, are derived from the origin of the nerves from the cords of the brachial plexus, the medial pectoral nerve from the medial cord and the lateral pectoral nerve from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. The name does not reflect their relation in the pectoral region. Identify the nerve A from which cord of the brachial plexus it originates and list two muscles supplied by this nerve. The nerve A is a terminal branch of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. It is the axillary nerve. Note here the posterior cord of the brachial plexus has two large terminal branches, the radial nerve and the axillary nerve. The axillary nerve leaves the axilla by passing through a quadrangular space in its posterior wall, while the radial nerve continues forwards into the arm. The two muscles supplied by the axillary nerve are the deltoid anterior minor muscles. Identify the artery B, name the arterial anastomosis it participates in. The artery B is a branch of the axillary artery. This is the axillary artery here. The axillary artery is divided into three parts by pectoralis minor muscle, which is reflected back here. The second part of the axillary artery is located behind the muscle and is related to the cords of the brachial plexus. Of course, the axillary vein is medial to the artery and would have obstructed the view if it is not dissected away in this specimen. So the second part of the axillary artery is located behind pectoralis minor muscle, and thus artery B is a branch of the third part of the axillary artery. It is the subscapular artery. The subscapular artery descends along the lateral border of the scapula and ends by dividing into a circumflex scapular and thoracodorsal arteries. The circumflex scapular artery passes around the lateral border of the scapula to supply muscles on the dorsal aspect. Thoracodorsal artery is the continuation of the subscapular artery along the lateral border of the scapula. Here there are several vessels that form an anastomosis around the scapula called the scapular anastomosis, and this provides a collateral circulation for the upper limb. This collateral circulation, the scapular anastomosis, is useful 
when ligating an injured axillary or subclavian artery. The first part of subclavian artery provides the suprascapular artery, not shown here because it is on the dorsal aspect of the scapula, so I will draw it as an interrupted. And this suprascapular artery, it anastomoses with the branches of the subscapular artery, and thus establishing an anastomosis between the first part of the subclavian and third part of axillary artery, known as the scapular anastomosis.